Truly he taught us to love one another His love is love and his gospel is peace Change shall he break A slave is our brother And in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord and And glory, the more proclaim, far 
never have to wait on you. And thank you that your presence doesn't leave us when we leave this place. But you're with us all the time. Be with us now in this service as we hear from you and what you would have to say to us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, you're getting you're getting some clap and love today. Um, morning, church. Why don't you go ahead and find your seat, and I'm going to find my music stand. Who should I steal, Allison? Thank you so much. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It's good to see your smiling faces. Most of you. You know who you are. Um, For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Hannah. I am the student pastor here going on, oh my goodness, seven years, which is going to fit into my message. So um, real quick. Full disclosure, I am seven months pregnant. So, (laughs) are you guys just going to clap at everything I say? Because I can be on board with that. Um, So, the reason I say that is because you need to know that I am perpetually out of breath. So, there's going to be a lot of this. (sighs) Okay, but it's all in my zone. I'll keep it in my zone. Um, I might even back up a little bit. I'm also perpetually thirsty which means I could probably take four to five bathroom breaks during this service. I won't, but just pray for me, okay? And don't come and talk to me after service (laughs) because I will be out this door and downstairs. Um, So just don't say I didn't warn you. I wanted to do our offering declaration. So if you have your offering or your tithes or your missions giving this morning, you can go ahead and get that ready. And we have it up here on the screen if you'd read it. With, you know what? I'm out of breath. Why don't you guys read it? What do you think about that? Okay. Heavenly Father. Amen. You guys delivered. Way to carry that. I appreciate it. I've got a good two minutes of talking now that can take place because you did that. So, amen. God, we ask that you bless those offerings. Thank you for being so faithful to us. And uh, just a reminder, you can drop your offering or your tithe in the basket um, at the end of service today. A few quick announcements. Um, We're going to watch a quick video. Um, There's information in the e-news, there's information on the app as well about some of our Christmas outreach opportunities that we have this year. Um, one of those that you've heard about in the last few weeks has been our support of Power Company Kids Club. How many of you guys love Power Company Kids Club? Yay! 
Has anyone donated to give a child a gift and gotten a super adorable ornament? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Miss Rochelle and Cece made these adorable ornaments. Um, and if you give $15 or more, I like to say or more because that's an option too. Um, that goes to buy a gift for a child in need in Detroit or in Pontiac. And not only that, but they get to hear about God. They get to hear about the gospel, and they are doing God's work. It's an awesome ministry. So let's watch this quick video, and then I will finish up the announcements. Throughout the year, the Power Company Kids Club is committed to empowering children and building champions through interactive programming, youth mentorship, and home visitations. While our programs are packed with exciting games, fun field competition, and zany antics by our wonderful leaders, they also include inspirational stories, important life lessons, and a message of hope. Because of the generosity of individual and corporate supporters, we've also been privileged to share a message of joy for over 25 years, a tangible message. Join the Power Company Kids Club family this holiday season as we set out on a quest to bring joy to the at-risk children of Pontiac and Detroit. Every gift of $15 puts a wrapped gift in a child's hand this Christmas. And for some, this may be the only gift they'll receive this year. Support Project Christmas Joy today. If that doesn't make you smile, I don't know what will. All right, so you can make that gift on the app. You can make that gift by marking your um, offering envelope, and we hope that you guys choose to partner with us. And you know, it's not about the gift, right? The gift is the expression of the greater gift, which is God's love for those kids that, that we want them to know. So um, consider giving to that. We would love to have your partnership. A um, few other announcements. Maybe somebody has a birthday. My sheet just says birthdays this week. I'm not all knowing. It's Tracy's birthday. Thank you. The Holy Spirit told me. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> happy birthday, Tracy. The 16th. Okay, we can celebrate early. That's okay. I believe in birthday months. So, it's my, person, my personal conviction. <laughs> Well, we hope you have a great birthday. Anybody else, if we're forgetting your birthday, we're sorry, but we're so glad you're born. Um, great job being born. You did awesome. Um, wanted to just remind you guys that, you know, when you send in prayer requests or you mark um, your connection card and turn that in with, with prayer uh, needs, we pray over those every week as a team. Um, some of the church members that come on Tuesdays gather and pray over those requests and those needs. So just know that um, you're supported and you're lifted up. And also when God meets those needs, when God answers those prayers, when you see him being faithful and providing, please share that with us because it encourages the body. It encourages us to continue to pray for each other and to continue to go to the Lord and do what he asks us to do, which is to put our requests before him. Um, so know that we're praying for you. Um, also, just want to remind everyone that we will have a Christmas Eve service. Um, it's the 24th, if you need a reminder. Uh, it's going to be one hour, five to six. It's candlelight. It's very moody. It's kind of my jam. Um, but it's also very hot in here, so don't wear a turtleneck. That's my pregnant lady advice to you on this fine Sunday, okay? Um, it gets warm in here, <laughs> and it's not just me. Um, so invite your neighbors, invite your friends. Uh, we'll be observing our same safety protocols as we have it on Sundays and Wednesdays, and it will also be live streamed. So we hope that you and your families will join us. And let's see, one more. The first week of January, oh my goodness, it's almost January, 2021. I'm so excited. Okay, but I just, in my mind, it's kind of May still. Like April, May, I don't know. I lost a good chunk of my timeline there. I don't know. So anyways, the first week of January is coming. And uh, we're going to be doing our week of prayer and fasting. And uh, we have some different things planned. So we're going to be having some prayer times throughout the week, potentially a movie. Don't tell Pastor Till I told you. As soon as I said it, I thought maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> Um, but we're going we're gonna to be showing and trying to just do some more creative options to get people connected and praying, and it's going to be a great first week of the year. So be looking for more details with that. Okay, I need a breather. You need a breather? You can take a breather. You guys actually took a deep breath. Somebody did. Was it you guys? Thanks, guys. All right, so for those of you who are wondering... Who gave Pastor Hannah the mic and then forgot to take it away? I don't know. 
Um, Pastor Tal is not feeling well today. He's doing okay, but he's being extra safe because that's just the awesome leader that he is. Amen? Um, so I am pinch hitting. He had an, an, a, just a really great message planned um, for this morning. Videotaped everything, and we had some technical difficulties. But uh, next week he'll be continuing on his part two, um, talking about God's love as we continue in Ephesians. So get excited for that. That will be next week, but until then, you're stuck with me. So, so we're going to have a 12-minute message and a 45-minute worship service. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, so I just want to let you guys know, please be pray- praying for Pastor Tal and Gwen. You know, just always pray for Pastor Tal and Gwen. Um, but especially, you know, they've had a, a rough week this week, and we just want them to be healthy and to, f- to feel God's presence this morning, even though they're not here. So... Actually, let's just start there. Why don't we pray? Sound good? Okay. God, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you, God, that you, God, you are not confined by walls or buildings, or live streams, or pre-planned messages. God, you, you are sovereign. You are awesome, God. And our desire, our cry this morning, Father, is that you come and you have your way in us as your people. Come into these temples, God, and have your way in us. God, may the, may the gravity of this season that we're celebrating not be lost on us. As we talk about that today, God, let it, let it rest in our hearts that you came, and because of that, everything is different. We thank you, God, that you've proven that over and over and over again. But, God, sometimes we need reminders. I know this morning I need a reminder. My brothers and sisters, God, we need reminders of the hope and the rest and the love that we can find simply because you decided to come. Let that reality wake us up this morning, God. We thank you for those um, of our church body that can't be here this morning. And, Lord, we know that even though we don't have a live stream, even though they're not here in person this morning, God, you are with them. And, God, all it takes is for them to open their hearts and their minds up to you and to step into that invitation, and, God, you meet them there. So, Lord, we pray for a move of your Holy Spirit in every house, in every apartment building, in every car, in every room, God, where someone is wanting to meet with you. Move in your people this morning. And God, for those who are not feeling well or or struggling in 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 just a different, deep way this week, in this weekend, Lord, we pray your blessing and your comfort and your healing that is possible because you came for us. We ask that you be with Pastor Tal and Gwen this morning. God, heal their bodies, get this sickness out, whatever it is, and Lord, give them your rest. We thank you for what you have planned this morning, God, and we ask that you would have your way. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so you thought I was kidding about a short message because you're used to me preaching an hour and 20 minutes. So I hate to disappoint, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, we're going to be reading out of Matthew 1 and a few other places. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and just get ready. Flip there. Um, going to rock a Christmas message because I love Christmas. Um, I wanted to, this is kind of connected to my message, but not entirely, but I thought that you guys would appreciate this. I wanted to put this picture up on the screen because, not yet, wait, Um, (laughs) uh, being pregnant during Advent has been 
different. Well, obviously different, but it's, um, it's made me just feel the season differently. I feel connected to that story in a different way. And um, one of my favorite artists, his name is Scott Erickson, he came out with this book called Honest Advent. And it's, uh, it's honest, but it's, he has these illustrations of various, various parts of scripture, various parts of um, Jesus' life and the Advent story just depicted in these really thought-provoking, deep, honest ways. And it's been something that has been really awesome for me, but I came across this picture. It's a redo of another woman's art, but I think his is really cool. So I want you guys to just see that and take it in. Who are those women? Eve and Mary. And what's on the ground there? The serpent and the apple. It's so easy to just like not think about that connection. But look at the way that Eve, Mary's taking Eve's hand and placing it on her belly. You know, I do that to Josh all the time. The code word, for anyone who's seen Ice Age, anyone seen Ice Age? Okay, Ice Age 2 where they have baby mammoths. Okay, and the code word for when the baby's coming is peaches. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So when the baby's kicking and I want Josh to feel the baby kicking, I say peaches. (laughs) Because sometimes she kicks and moves, and then as soon as he gets close, she stops. I don't know what that means. but um, So the code word is peaches, but I'll do that because I want him to feel there's life in there, that God is doing something. And when I see this picture, and I think about the mother of our Savior taking the hand of a fallen woman with all the weight of that sin on her shoulders and saying, feel. Feel this life. Feel this hope. Feel what's coming that's going to change everything. Do you notice what Mary's foot is doing? She's crushing the serpent. Something that scripture promised us that the Messiah would do. There's so much symbolism and so much power in that image. And as I've been, you know, just walking through this Advent season and walking through being pregnant for the first time, um, there's so much uncertainty with carrying a baby. There's so so many things that are unknown, so many fears, so many worries, so many what-ifs. But at the same time, you know, when the angel came to Mary, let's back up a second. First, an angel comes to um, Elizabeth, and she conceives a child, remember? And her husband does not believe, and the angel says, because you didn't... Because you didn't believe me, your lips will be sealed until the baby's born. Some wives are like, I wish, right? Um, <laughs> but that's not what Mary did. When the angel comes to Mary, she's like, I'm, I'm the Lord's servant. If that's, what, if that's what you're telling me needs to happen, then I'm supposed to carry this crazily consumed child and, and still be a virgin and be engaged and go, th- okay. She just, she says, okay. She's like, I'm the Lord's servant and I will do it. And she carried, yes, all those concerns and all those fears and those what-ifs, but she also carried our Savior. And in doing so, it's not just about that one pregnancy. It's not just about that one birth. It's about everything that's represented in this photo. It's about sin and death and Satan being crushed. It's about what was done in the Garden of Eden being undone and restored because Jesus came. That's what I see when I look at that photo. I see the reality and the promise and the hope of what Jesus brings. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, We're going to start in the book of Matthew. And... um, 
you know, scripture is so rich, and it's so, it just reveals over and over and over how sovereign and how um, just incredible our creator God is. Am I right? And the more you spend time in it, the more you realize, like, it's just there's so many layers, and there's so much more for us to know and for us to learn. And, um, you know, I was thinking this morning even about how, you know, there's things that have been proven by science that were originally in Scripture. There's science used in some of the ways that Scripture is, um, is written and, and given to us that show all these scientific things. Same way with math. Same way with literature. If you love words like me, if you're like a word nerd, okay, we can talk about this all day, but like the, like the Bible has all these literary devices like imagery and poetry and all this kind of stuff. God's word is so alive, and not just for then, but for now. And not just once, always, for today. And I bring that up because, unfortunately, I have to talk about math which Josh would tell you is not my strong suit. We are praying big, big prayers that our daughter gets Josh's math skills <laughs> just to make her life easier. Um, I'm not good at math. does not come strongly to me. Josh teases me because I still count on my fingers. <laughs> and that's just, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm not alone. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Um, <laughs> So if that's you, stick with me. And if I say something wrong, you can correct me later after I go to the bathroom. Um, so, you know, there's some books that start off, like, that start off, what's the thing of, like, the fairy tale book? How does it start? Once upon a time. It's such a good first line, right? I think of, like, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Or even Genesis, In the Beginning. That's kind of, kind of an obvious first line, but the first line is supposed to be like what grabs you, what brings you in, and what gets you excited to keep reading. And when we come to Matthew, if you're there in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew doesn't get it. He does not get that literary device of a good first line. Here's his first line. A record of the genealogy of Jesus, which is code for wah, wah, wah. That's code for, oh, look, my Bible autumn, it just flipped to Matthew 2. <laughs> I'm going to start reading Matthew 2. Whoops. Um, don't know how that happened. I know you guys do it too, okay? It's even worse than the Old Testament, but we're not going to go there. Um, but that's how he chooses to start his book, a record of the genealogy of Jesus. And you're like, great, all these names that I can't pronounce. I love it. Feeling the Lord's presence in here right now. Okay. So we skip it, honestly, don't we? Sometimes we skip it. It's okay. This is a safe space. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about why it's okay to skip it, but you still need to know what it means. Because there's some deep, rich meaning in that genealogy that points us to who Jesus is and why he came, and the hope that we have in him. So Matthew, I'm not going to read it for the reason that I cannot pronounce most of those names, and I still want you guys to like me when I'm done with this. Um, so I'm not going to read it, but it goes through all the different generations, right? It goes through Abraham, David, all the way down to what happens after the exile, and then verse 17, thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to Christ. And it would be really easy to just read it and skip through it. But he emphasizes that for a reason. He thinks, I'm going to give the whole first chunk of this first chapter of this book where I'm talking about the life of Christ and why he came and what he did for us. I'm going to give a good chunk of it to this boring list, but there's a reason. He emphasizes that genealogy. He starts with Abraham. And to David, which is 14 generations. Everybody say 14. Then Abraham, I'm sorry, David to the exile, which is 14. Then the exile to the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. 14 more generations. So 14, 14, 14. Now if you break that down, that is six sets of seven. 
And what that means, church, is that Jesus, our Messiah, is the beginning of the 77th generation. And you all should have gasped, but you don't know why that matters. (gasps) No, not the 77th. That's my favorite number. Jesus is the beginning of the 77th generation. Now, in Scripture, you might be familiar with this. The number seven, it matters. It has a lot of meaning. There's a lot of symbolism there. Like I mentioned before, Josh and I have been um, serving here at Church of the King for seven years. And um, we got a sabbatical this year, a time of, of being away from ministry responsibilities. It's a huge blessing to just step back and rest and have a break. And seven has this symbolism. That's why you have a sabbatical at your seventh year. It's from scripture. It means wholeness. It means completion. And most commonly, and my favorite, it symbolizes rest. You know, in the book of Genesis, we see God go all out in creation. Because that's just how he does stuff, right? But then on the seventh day, on the seventh day, he, he steps back and he says, he calls it good. And he says, now we're going to rest. And he ceases from working and he rests. And the best part of that is that he then extends that rest to us on that seventh day. Sabbath is my favorite day of the week. That's a different sermon. But anyways, um, this morning we're going to talk really briefly about hope and rest. Hope and rest. How many of you guys think you could use some hope today? Need some hope? Sometimes hope feels like this flighty, far-off thing, right? Like it's just a feeling. But if you, if you study what hope means in Scripture, it is personified in Jesus. It's not, it's not this floofy, floaty thing that we just feel on and off. It is connection and relationship sustained in the person of Jesus. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what we wait for during Advent. What about rest? Maybe you feel like you need rest today? You're like, yeah, I snoozed for two hours after my alarm went off. We all need rest. And there's something about this Christmas season that just makes everybody so rushed and hurried and numb almost to what this is about and what this is for. And my prayer every Christmas is, Lord, slow me down so I don't miss you. Slow me down so I don't miss you because all of this is for you, God. All the lights, all the gifts, all the everything that we celebrate and recognize, God, it's for you. And if we're too busy and rushed and hopeless and tired to notice you in this season, why even do it? What's the point? We all need rest. And I don't just mean like, oh, yeah, that day after Christmas when everything's done and you're like, oh, no, I can just chill in my PJs all day. Like we haven't all been doing that for 2020. Um, just me? Okay. Um, but we need a, a deeper kind of rest. I don't just mean a day off. I don't mean a vacation. I don't mean time away from school and work. I mean that soul level rest where God says, no, your work is done. Hello? God. <laughs> that was really good timing. <laughs> I think I need a new bag.
Test, test. Everybody's favorite sound. Okay, so if you're, whoa. <clears throat> <laughs> if uh, you're wondering what the church wants for Christmas, it's double A batteries. <laughs> Stocking stuffer idea. Um, <laughs> so I literally said, God said no, and then the mic <laughs> died. I love it. Um, okay, it'll be a miracle if I don't trip on this. So I don't remember what I was saying. How about we just go on to the next part? <laughs> Sound good? Um, so we're talking about hope, and we're talking about rest. And, uh, you know, going back to that idea that Jesus is the beginning of the 77th generation. Um, you guys ever heard of the year of Jubilee? Familiar with that, that concept in scripture? So the book of Leviticus talks about how every 49 years, which is, what's seven times seven? What's seven times seven? I felt like everybody was test, like, test, test. 40 something. You have calculators on your phone, people. That's why I count on my fingers still, because I'm like, I don't need to learn math. I got it on my phone. Um, so 49 years, which is seven periods of seven years. And Scripture, God in Scripture declares that um, every 49 years there would be a year of Jubilee. And Jubilee is a cool word. It's fun to say. Um, the year of Jubilee was basically this year that would come where all debts were forgiven. So if you if someone owed money for land or for work or whatever, that debt was automatically forgiven, no strings attached. Any, um, you know, unfortunately there were, there were um, indentured servants at this time and they would be returned. They would be set free. They would be let go from their, their work and their responsibilities. There would be freedom. And there's so much more that we could talk about that, but I'm out of breath, so I'm not going to do it. Um, but all you need to know is that the year of Jubilee was this time of forgiveness and freedom, and it came after seven times seven, 49 years. Now let's go ahead and why don't you uh, flip with me to Luke 14. The Pursuit students know I reference this verse a lot. It's one of my favorite um, call these these types of these passages of scripture like Jesus in action scriptures because there's there's times you know e everywhere in the bible you can read and you can you can connect it back to Jesus it's called the it's called the red thread there's this red thread all through scripture that no matter where we are it could be Leviticus it could be Revelation we can see Jesus we can find him there but then there's these passages of scripture where it is just Jesus in action it is Jesus walking talking it is God with legs walking around and showing us in the flesh, in real life, what God is like. And there's something so powerful about that. And so I love these types of passages that show Jesus on the move. Um, did I say the wrong? I think I said the wrong passage here. Hold on one second. Luke 14 is too late. My bad. It's a multiple of seven, so we'll just pretend that that's why I did that. Okay, we're going to do Luke 4. That's why. Luke chapter 4, and we're going to start with um, around verse 14. And uh, there's, oh, there's, so, there's so many like just deep, rich things happening in this passage right here. But basically what's happening is Jesus is, uh, he's just started his ministry. John the Baptist has gone before him, and he's coming into the temple to teach. And um, at that time, they would have had a structure up at the front of the temple where the different rabbis could come up and pull out a scroll to read scripture. And so Jesus walks in, probably in slow-mo with the disciples. That's how I picture it, um, like a movie. But Jesus comes in, and uh, scripture says, here, here, how about this? Let's just read it. Verse 16. It said, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue on the seventh day. 
as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Because he was a respected rabbi, so he stood up to read and people were listening. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Keep that in mind. Jesus didn't pick it. This will matter later. Jesus didn't pick up the scroll. It was given to him. It was what was determined to be read in the temple that day. And that matters. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written. And then he's, 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 this is a quote, okay, from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, catch this, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I always tell the students, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a first century mic drop. You know, you can't drop the scroll, that's not dramatic, but he's just like, boom, like, it's me. Essentially what he's saying is that Messiah that you've been waiting for, he's here. And it's me. I have come, and it is me, and it's not just, it's me, period. It's, it's me, and I'm going to do everything that it's been said I would do. Jesus is saying, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. I have been anointed. I will preach the good news. I will set the captives free. I will bring forgiveness. I will, I will release people who are oppressed. But at the very end there, when he says, that he will do all this to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There's a little bit lost in translation there. You guys know the Bible wasn't written in English, right? If only, right? <laughs> so there is some loss in translation, but at the end of that, where Jesus is saying um, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, or your Bible might say the acceptable year of the Lord, or something like that, or your Bible might say the year of Jubilee or a time of jubilee. Jesus comes into the temple, announces that he is the Messiah who has come to fulfill all of that prophecy, does the mic drop, and then basically just says, I am your jubilee. I am your jubilee. Because that's what the Messiah does. You know, I don't believe, and theologians and scholars would agree that Jesus beginning the 77th generation is not just by chance. It's not just like, oh, wow, that's nice that those numbers lined up like that. I'm type A and I appreciate it. No, there's purpose and there's meaning. There's a reason behind it. And when we look beneath the surface of what we see just in black and white here, we see his word come to life. And Jesus began the 77th generation and that fact right there is a testimony through numbers that our rest has arrived. That our jubilee has come. That's what we celebrate during Advent. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. The way God orchestrates things and connects things Church, if we pay attention, we can see his fingerprints in so many things if we just watch. When I think about Jesus coming into the temple, and he's later rejected and they try to kill him. You know how this story goes. But he was so dead set that at the very beginning, the first thing he wanted people to know is that he would do what was prophesied all the way back in the book of Isaiah. That he would come and that he would be our jubilee. And not just at Christmas, but all year round. Every day. Not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, but every minute of our life, we get to look to the Lord and get to say, you, God, are my jubilee. I might be oppressed here, but I know that you're coming and you're bringing me freedom. Yes, I have. I was born into sin, and I struggle with sin, but God, you give me forgiveness. 
because of what Jesus did for me. All those debts, forgiven. Iniquities, as scripture calls them, wiped away, clean. He, church, is our jubilee. I don't have any deep way to end this morning, but I want to introduce an idea of maybe just a new way to be present in this season of Advent, of Christmas, of of waiting. Um, you know, I told you that we were going to be talking about hope and rest, and you know, we, we talk about Jesus coming and being born and all of the details of what that means at Christmas time. But it's so much bigger. You know, we say all the time, Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. <laughs> really think about that. God with us. Or better yet, fill it in and say, God with me. Emmanuel, God with me, God with you. That is a big deal. And there's this cycle because we have Emmanuel, right? Because God is with us, we have hope, right? Be because Jesus was born, because he came, fully God, fully man, ready and willing to lay down his life so that all those sins and those trespasses and those debts could be forgiven and we could be made right with God. Because he did that, we have hope that is undeniable, that cannot be taken from us. So God is with us, and because of that, we can have hope. And because we have hope, church, guess what? We get to rest. We get to rest. I think some of you would agree or feel this with me, that like a lot of times we know things in our heads about God, but then we do things that are contrary to what we know, right? So I know, I know we're celebrating Emmanuel. I know we're celebrating God with us. But then there's, and I know that that should bring me hope, but then there's times in my life where I continue to, to work and to strive, and to push, and to try and do things on my own, and to, and to manipulate things to go the way that I think they should go, and to, to pray prayers based on my own will and not the will of the Lord. God is telling us that he is with us, and because he's with us, we can have hope. And because we have hope, we don't have to do all that. Because we have hope, church, we get to rest. We get to rest in who he is. We get to rest in his love. We get to rest in the fact that what he has done for us, just like that number seven, it is whole, it is complete. There is nothing that can be added or taken away from it. It is done, and we have everything that we need because of Emmanuel, God with us. And what happens is that cycle just keeps going. You know he's with you, and that gives you hope. And when you know you have hope, you can rest. And you know what happens is you rest in God's love and in who God is. You're reminded, oh, God is with me. I have so much hope, and I can rest in that. God is with me, and I have hope, and I can rest. And then as we walk around and we're going about our days and living our lives, we carry that reality with us into a world that desperately needs to know that God is not just with us, but God is with them. And then we don't just have hope because we go to church. We have hope because we are connected to the Savior and our sins are forgiven and we are made right with God and are ready to spend eternity with him. And that that is available to anyone that we cross paths with. If you need hope this morning, if you need rest, I want to challenge you to recapture what it means to have Jesus as your jubilee. To just remember, to spend time, even in this next week, it's only like two weeks till Christmas, which is crazy. 
But every day, you guys know that anticipation as a, as a child where you feel that, like, you're getting closer to Christmas Eve and you're so excited. And I remember, like, not being able to sleep and everything that comes with that. That should happen for us as Jesus followers. Because we know, we know that we're getting closer and closer and closer to celebrating this exciting, momentous time where God decided to move into the neighborhood and change everything. That's why we have hope. And that's why we get to rest. Because Jesus is our jubilee. And when we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate him coming and saying, I'm setting people free. I'm forgiving your sins. I'm erasing your debts. You have nothing to worry about or strive for. Rest in me. You know, I think about Jesus later in Matthew. (laughs) He invites people who are tired to come to him. It's a verse I come back to so often. Are you tired? Are you weary? Come to me, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus says to us. And in a season where we can be so busy and so distracted, those are the two things that we can focus on, coming to him and resting in him. He has everything we need. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. Christmas and every day, because that's what we need to know. So to end this morning, um, we're going to go into a time of worship. Worship team, if you want to go ahead and come back up. And, you know, I think everyone approaches this season differently. Maybe, um, maybe this just needs to be a time of reflection for you, a time of really pausing and, and, and making sure that you're paying attention to what God is doing in you and around you and through you this season. Or maybe you need to actually have a conversation with him because you're struggling to feel his love this morning. You're struggling to to grasp that hope. Or honestly, you're just tired and you need his rest. Church, he says he, he supplies all our needs according to his riches. That's what scripture tells us. Whatever it is that you need this morning, whether it's a reminder of that love, whether it's just recapturing that hope that we have because Jesus is our jubilee, or, or maybe it's just a reminder where he gets, to just, he gets to just rest on you and say, okay, daughter, okay, son, just spend time in my presence. Just rest in me. And I'll rest on you. Come to me if you're, if you're tired, if you're weary, if you're burdened. I'm going to give you some rest this morning. So as we worship, we're going to sing about God's love. We're going to sing about his Holy Spirit. We're going to sing about everything that he is coming and resting in us. And I want to encourage you to to stand up or kneel or stay seated, but to just do whatever you need to do to engage with God this morning. We're starting this a little bit earlier, so we have 15 minutes or so before kids are going to get dismissed. Parents, that's golden time. Enjoy this time in God's presence. Wait on Him. Rest in Him. Savor Him for everything that He is as your jubilee this season. as we enter into worship, as we continue to worship you, God. Sometimes we say things in worship times, Lord, because we might know them in our heads, but we need to speak them out with our lips so that our spirits start to really believe them. And so, God, I pray this morning as we, as we sing and pray and talk about your love. Would you make it real to us this day? Holy Spirit, would you come and rest on us and reveal your love?
would you remind us that even in times of difficulty or times of hurry, that Jesus, you are our jubilee and that we can have hope and we can rest because you came and we have everything we need in you. Oh Lord, come and inhabit the praises of your people this morning. This is all for you. We want more of you. Have your way in us, God. We love you. We worship you. In your name we pray.
this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled filled to the measure of all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be the glory to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Be filled with God's hope this morning. Rest in him today. If you would like prayer, you can go ahead and come on up. I'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, God bless and have an awesome day.